So hello everyone, thank you for um, the introduction, Peter, and thank you to Low Carb Down Under for the opportunity to present on this topic, preconception and prenatal health, and how low carb diets, I believe, should be an option that is offered to all women when they are considering pregnancy. So in terms of what I'm gonna cover in the talk today, I want to talk about briefly the current dietary guidelines regarding pregnancy and what might be some of the problems with those and how low carb may be a safe nutrition option for women in preconception, particularly because of epigenetics. And I want to talk also about gestational diabetes because that's quite a burgeoning problem that we've got in Australia at the moment. And this talk doesn't constitute individualized medical advice. So why am I talking about perinatal health? I'm not an obstetrician, but I am a GP who cares for women through all of the life stages. And I particularly am uh, excited to work with women at this very um, daunting and sometimes vulnerable time in their life when they're considering pregnancy and uh, going through a pregnancy um, in and of itself. And I'm also aware of the wide range of opinions that are held by health professionals, particularly when it comes to um, obstetrics. And I've got a commitment to learn more that is beyond the standard medical guidelines, particularly when I want to inform women of what their choices are. I also have a personal interest in this area as well, because like one in six Australian couples, my husband and I also found it difficult to fall pregnant, taking us more than one year to conceive with both of our children. And my two pregnancies were quite different in terms of the dietary patterns that I used. So my first pregnancy was what you would describe as a paleo pregnancy. I didn't know about seed oils then, or I didn't really understand about the fructose and fruit sugar issues. Uh, but in my second pregnancy, I had a lot more knowledge and I proceeded through a ketogenic uh, pregnancy. And I had two different deliveries as well. So my first was a cesarean section, and my second was a vaginal birth after cesarean. So I felt that my N equals one in terms of my ketogenic pregnancy amounted in a pregnancy that was far more comfortable. I didn't suffer from any nausea. I had greater healing and recovery afterwards. And I found that my mental health was quite stable compared to the first pregnancy as well, which is interesting given that many women suffer silently with things like postnatal depression. And then also I found that my breast milk supply was better and I was able to meet the energy demands that pregnancy um, puts women through. But as I went through pregnancy, I came across all the misconceptions that are out there when it comes to low carb diets and pregnancy. In fact, uh, there, are, there are so many popular websites um, that many women read online that uh, say that the ketogenic diet should be skipped and it's one and it's a diet trend that should be avoided and it's for all these reasons listed here that many people are scared about using a low carb diet in pregnancy but what I did find is that with further research there's actually no high level scientific evidence to support the minimum 175 gram carbohydrate intake that is recommended currently by our dietary guidelines this recommendation is actually based on the premise that any lower than 175 grams of carbohydrate will generate ketones in a pregnant woman and that those ketones may adversely affect fetal brain development. And we'll talk about that a little bit further. These guidelines are essentially requesting women to consume nine servings of bread, rice, cereal and pasta every day. And this is an example of a food tray I was given when I went into hospital when I was in labor. What this number of carbohydrates does for women is that it leaves them unable to meet their nutrient requirements and it quite often exceeds their energy needs. And what this equates to is about 45 to 65% of their daily calorie intake coming from carbohydrates. So, Let's look at why these guidelines are not as evidence-based as you think. And much of this information is informed by a phenomenal dietitian called Lily Nichols, uh, who's from America, and she's written extensively and looked at the literature on this subject. And I'm just going to try to neatly summarise here some of the problems with our evidence as it stands. So with the studies that we base the micronutrient needs on in pregnancy, 
We know that of many of the studies that were involved in putting together those micronutrients, that only 17% of the participants in these studies were even pregnant or lactating. And in fact, most of these participants were actually men. <laughs> So we've used arbitrary numbers and calorie intakes for men and nutrient intakes for men and added on what we think is necessary for the baby and the pregnant woman to proceed through a successful pregnancy. We also have very little scientific evidence when it comes to limiting fat intake in pregnancy. Most of the evidence currently that, we, that the guidelines use to say that fat is bad actually arise from rat studies that enrich the rat chow with um, more fat, usually in the form of refined soybean oil, and then they measure pregnancy outcomes. Now, soybean is a seed oil, and it is very high in linoleic acid, uh, which is a form of omega-6 fat. And this has been demonstrated repeatedly to pr produce, when it's consumed in abnormal ratios, excessive weight gain, high blood sugar levels, and elevated markers of inflammation. So, these sorts of connections between high fat that is of seed oil origin and having negative outcomes, it's no surprise. But I think when we look at the healthier fats, which we'll come to later in the talk, these are actually far more beneficial and required in a healthy pregnancy. Then thirdly, the um, intake of protein in women in pregnancy has been shown to be far lower than what is adequate. In fact, most of the recent studies that not only use food surveys but also use traces of amino acids um, have actually found that in the second trimester, 40% of women are actually achieving their, their protein intake, which is quite little. And then by the third trimester, it's about 67% of women achieving the adequate protein intake. And lastly, the ketone danger myth um, that stems from research that was done in the 1960s and... It was done in women measuring their urinary ketones when they went into labour. So this is usually a time when you're not eating, you're not drinking, and so there is very, very likely to be some ketones in the urine. And what they did was somehow correlate that level of ketones with subsequent infant IQ um, in, in toddlerhood. So it was pretty poorly done. It was only a once-off measurement in labour. So I, I really find that we can't base a lot of our evidence on that and actually subsequent studies have refuted this point entirely. But it's also not just about food. I want to make, make a quick mention about the oral contraceptive pill, which many women take right up until the time they decide to fall pregnant. And we have to be aware that the OCP can actually cause nutrient depletion. And it does this because it can reduce the utilisation and absorption of nutrients within the gastrointestinal tract. And as a consequence, many women who've been on the OCP for quite a long time can actually be B vitamin deficient, which includes folate, which is B9, vitamin C and E, selenium, zinc and magnesium, which are actually key micronutrients within pregnancy. So what foods do you actually really need to conceive? The foods uh, that we do need are our ancestral foods. These are the small fatty fish, the leafy green vegetables, full fat dairy and meats, including organ meats, seasonal fruits, nuts and seeds. So if you tell someone you're on the Mediterranean diet in pregnancy, nobody will bat an eyelid at you. But if you tell them you're on low carb or keto, then suddenly that changes things. And yet they are almost the same parallel universe. And the key nutrients in pregnancy that we do need are folate, iodine, iron, choline, omega-3 and amino acids. So to ensure the sufficiency, we know that from studies that were done in 2011, that when they looked at more than 200 modern hunter-gatherer populations, they were consuming average carbohydrate intakes of between 16 to 22% of their daily calories coming from carbs. And if you recall earlier, I mentioned the standard dietary guidelines are looking at 45 to 65% of their calorie intake from carbohydrates. So you can see there's quite a big difference, and yet they're still delivering healthy babies in those populations. So now I just want to talk about how what we eat has a profound impact on the developing baby as it influences their gene expression. 
And the nutrition is so important in this um, component when we look at the before pregnancy part and during pregnancy, because these are key determinants of pregnancy success and next generation health. So there's no, it doesn't get any more root cause than looking at the health of an embryo. And this particular snapshot here is just looking at uh, three sort of postulated um, mechanisms or areas that we need to be considering in our health promotion for pregnant women. And one is about the biological standpoint when someone's actually falling pregnant and the health of that embryo at the very, very earliest stage. The second is about when the individual is deciding to conceive and that period and lead into that. And the third is about the whole lifespan that is the time of, a, of childbearing age. And that means that it's from the first time that a woman actually develops a menstrual cycle. So we need to actually be thinking about the health of our teenage women and then the women in their 20s who may not be ready to conceive a child but should actually be aware of the health ramifications at that age when it comes on to later parts in their life where they may want to conceive. So in other words, genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. And this is seen in a very apparent way when we look at obesity leading into pregnancy. So this schematic shows four broad periconceptional environmental exposures that are shown to induce adverse effects in humans and in animal models. And in Australia right now, we have up to 50% of women who are obese or overweight when they become pregnant. And we know that this can disrupt their metabolic programming of the embryo. And it's not just maternal obesity that is a problem for this, it's also the father. It's also paternal obesity that can be linked to the impaired fertility by affecting sperm quality and its quantity. And that is also associated with increased chronic disease risk in the offspring. So in terms of preconception weight loss, there, is, there was this fantastic cohort uh, study that was done which looked at uh, women who experienced a weight loss of 10%. They found that that was associated with a clinically meaningful risk reduction in many of the complications that can occur in pregnancy and in the neonate itself. And further to that, what this uh, particular study looked at was it's bolded in the yellow line there is that it represents the current level of overweight and obesity at the moment in women in middle and higher income countries. So that really reflects Australia's position at the moment. And what they found is that because weight loss is something that doesn't just happen overnight, in fact, it takes you know at least six months or more for a significant amount of weight loss to occur. And even more than that, it takes much longer to establish a dietary pattern that's sustainable. And we know, we know that in our clinical practice that it can take quite some time to establish this. So it's important that we actually need to be starting up to three years prior to that time of conception. So that is far more than what is our current directive when we just let women know, oh, just start taking a prenatal supplement three months before you decide to start trying. I think we need to be far more proactive than that. And it's important that we reverse things like insulin resistance well prior to the time of conception. So one of the common questions I receive in the clinic from women is how low carb should I really go in pregnancy? And the short answer is it depends. And the longer answer is that it does take an understanding of the nuance between the different forms of ketosis. Generally speaking, the lower the carbs, the higher the production of ketones. And in pregnancy, I find in clinical practice, the sweet spot for most pregnant women is usually above 50 grams of carbohydrates. So they're usually sitting more at around 80 grams of carbohydrate, right up to 150 grams. And that depends on if they were metabolically well going into their pregnancy or if they were actually metabolically unwell when they fell pregnant. In terms of the three forms of ketosis that we must be aware of, the safe spot is nutritional ketosis. This has been well established to be a safe state in pregnancy. And this is what we aim for through a pregnancy as well. We do not recommend that women fast when they're trying to conceive or once they have become pregnant. And starvation ketosis is what can amount when fasting is engaged in, often in pregnant women. 
And what we do uh, recommend is that we want women to have as many nutrients as possible. So that's another reason why we don't recommend the reduction in the number of meals. And lastly, on the red side is ketoacidosis. And that's not to be confused with nutritional ketosis, though many health professionals still confuse these two terms. And that is really a state of extremely high blood sugar and high ketone levels and a very acidic blood pH. So this is dangerous to the fetus and dangerous to the mother. And it, it's luck, luckily for most women, this is not a situation they will find themselves in. It's really just a minority of women who need to be counseled on this. And usually these are type one diabetic women in pregnancy. So are the ketones safe for the baby? Well, this, um, this has been well established in the literature and much of this stems from the work of George Cahill, who'd shown that newborns and infants are actually frequently in and out of ketosis in their early period of childhood. In fact, they're almost in and out of ketosis every two to four hours. And children up to the age of six to eight years of age, even if they're not on a low carbohydrate diet, are frequently in and out of ketosis within a 24 hour period. So we know that pregnant women as well are well known to go in and out of ketosis. And in fact, many pregnant women will be three, have ketones that are three times higher than their baseline when they're pregnant. And the human body really has two fuel options. These are glucose or ketones. And it's often wrongly assumed that glucose is the preferred fuel source simply because the body is so efficient at keeping it in such tight control. It knows that the glucose it being either too high or too low, it can be very damaging to the pregnant woman, but also far more to the fetus. And lastly, babies can actually use ketones for growth and development. Up to 30% of the brain function can be derived from the source, sources of ketones. And press, breast milk is ketogenic. It's a ketogenic substance. And that keeps the newborn in and out of ketosis if they're exclusively breastfeeding. So let's consider the medical condition of where the mother has higher than normal blood sugar. And this is gestational diabetes. It is the most common uh, diabetes complication in pregnancy, and it affects one in seven Australian pregnant women. And this number has escalated drastically in the last 10 years. Often these women are actually undiagnosed pre-diabetics going into pregnancy. And the traditional management for this um, a condition is diet control using the standard dietary guidelines for pregnancy, which involves nine servings of grains per day. So often when this fails, we add on metformin, and then we may add on insulin later down the track when it's much harder for these women who have very little understanding as to what's going on with these high carbs causing a high glucose in their bloodstream. There are serious knock-on effects when this isn't controlled, and one of which is that it can result in NICU admissions for neonates because they get a resultant hypoglycemia when they're delivered. So is low carb safe in gestational diabetes as per the Diabetes Australia position statement on it? Let's have a, a look at this. Because un unfortunately, it still remains a controversial topic in Australia. Now, what they wrote in their most recent position statement in 2018 is that they don't really seem to fear ketones. That's not really the, the reason. The reason that they say that low carb eating should not be recommended for pregnant women is due to the potential folate deficiency resulting in an increased risk of birth defects. So I thought, let's go have a look at this study, reference 16. Now this study, low carbohydrate diets may increase risk of neural tube defects, actually was looking at data from the American National Birth Defects Prevention Study, which took about 1,800 women who had delivered infants with neural tube defects and compared them to women uh, about, I think they had found about 9,000 mothers in the same time period who delivered without a birth defect. And then, Weirdly, they interviewed them up to 24 months after they delivered their child about what they ate before they fell pregnant and then what they might have eaten when they were in the early part of pregnancy. And I don't know about you, but I can't even remember with great clarity what I ate two or three days ago. 
<laughs> let alone something that was 24 months ago. So just as an aside, what is a neural tube defect? It's where the spine doesn't develop appropriately and it's well known to have its origins in the earliest part of the pregnancy. So this is at three to four weeks of gestation, often when the woman doesn't even know she's pregnant yet. And there were more problems with this study beyond these infamous food frequency questionnaires that we often see in nutritional epidemiology. They looked, they kind of derived this total dietary folate intake, and that was because they put together synthetic folic, folic acid, which was taken in the form of supplements, and they added that to the naturally occurring folate in foods. And then they, quote, they, they wrote, they quoted, that the folic acid was weighted heavily, so it was two times that of the natural folate, they just decided this is an arbitrary number, to account for its enhanced bioavailability. On one hand, that's true, yes, but they didn't, they failed to mention this issue that we now know about with the MTHFR gene variants, which affect up to 50% of the population. And people who carry these gene variants can actually metabolize folic acid far less efficiently. So they don't do well when we give them synthetic folic acid as a supplement. Particularly we see this in pregnancy. And I feel like the only appropriate conclusion they could have really made is that having a folate deficient diet may lead to neural tube defects, which is well established in the literature. We already knew that. And yet the title of the study is very misleading in that it labels low carb diets as being folate deficient. But I've taken the liberty of going and looking for what are the folate rich sources that are not folate enriched or artificially enriched. And we've got plenty of options when we're on a low carbohydrate diet. So even if you rule out the things that were fortified, we still have many, many options that we should be counseling women on and that they should be eating in pregnancy to ensure that they have enough folate available. Now, I just want to talk quickly about if, uh, what happens if the mother does have a, an uncontrolled gestational diabetes. Well, what happens is that the blood sugar from the mother will actually cross the placenta and increase the amount of glucose that the fetus receives. But unfortunately, the insulin produced by the mother cannot cross the placenta into the fetus. So here we have a fetus that is left fairly defenseless for the first trimester because they only start to produce their own insulin from their baby pancreases at about 10 to 12 weeks gestation. And they reach the height of their own insulin production in the third trimester. The fetus does have some mechanisms to protect itself from the potential harm of sugars, but these are not a fail-safe mechanism. And so we actually know, and it's well recognised, that uncontrolled gestational diabetes can independently also lead to an increased risk of neural tube defects through pathways that are mentioned here of oxidative stress, gene mutations and apoptosis. So just to arc back to that diabetes position statement and highlight the absurdity of the reason put forward on their statement is that on one hand we're telling women to consume grains that are fortified with synthetic folate to avoid neural tube defects. But on the other hand, those very same carbohydrates in, re in those refined grains can actually unveil gestational diabetes in pregnancy and worsen its severity. No wonder women are confused on how to eat in pregnancy. So women are screened for gestational diabetes fairly late in their pregnancy, which adds another level of absurdity to this whole story. And this happens between 24 to 28 weeks gestation, well past the time of neural tube defect formation. And this is when they're two thirds of the way through pregnancy and the reason it's done this way is most women are insulin resistant at this phase, at the highest level of their insulin resistance. And the oral glucose tolerance test in most women is not a very pretty test. It is actually consists of having to drink 75 grams of sugar and have your blood tested um, before the drink, one hour in and two hours later. So most women actually find this quite a nauseating experience. <laughs> 
The criteria that's used to actually diagnose gestational diabetes is based on the hyperglycemia and adverse pregnancy outcomes trial, which was one of the largest studies of more than 25,000 women uh, that was finding that even a mild elevation in blood sugar can actually affect the baby. So if you have at least one of these values elevated on your test, you're diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And recently, as a result of this trial, we've had those parameters tightened. So where it used to be acceptable to have a fasting glucose of 5.5 and above, or sorry, 5.5, it is now advisable for it to be under 5.1. So thankfully, something is you know, being picked up a little bit more stringently. But women who are eating a low-carb dietary pattern actually need to be aware that they do run the risk of a false positive on this test unless they carb load for three days prior to the testing. And this has been well documented in the scientific research since at least the 1960s. So when you don't regularly eat a lot of carbohydrates, your pancreas doesn't make a lot of insulin at any one time because it just doesn't need to. This is physiological insulin resistance. So we really need better screening options for our women who choose to use low carbohydrate as an option. HbA1c is one such screening option that could be used and is now regularly being used by some clinicians. And research has shown that if you've got an elevated HbA1c above 5.9% in the first trimester, that it's 98.4% predictive of a positive oral glucose tolerance test later. And Additionally, we also have continuous glucose monitors now, which are opening up a whole other um, area that we can monitor and help women achieve better pregnancy glucose targets. So the CONCEPT trial was one of the, uh, I suppose, the seminal studies on this, in this area, which, used, which was looking at women, type 1 diabetic women in pregnancy, either assigned to using a CGM as a means to monitor their blood sugars or using finger prick blood glucose testing. And the primary outcome they were looking at was HbA1c. And what they found across the board was that there was a 0.2% reduction in the HbA1c for women who were using continuous glucose monitoring versus the women who were using finger prick glucose monitoring only through their pregnancies. And this extended from almost through the entire pregnancy, but really took off and elevated between 24 weeks to the time of delivery. 0.2% doesn't sound like very much, but what it actually meant practically for these women was that they were spending, the CGM women were spending an extra 100 minutes per day in what we call time in range, which are the green zones. And this was a phenomenal, uh, had a phenomenally significant effect on the neonates who were born to these women. They spent uh, less time in the NICU, they were out of the hospital earlier, and they had less incidence for large for gestational age babies. And as a result, in the UK, this is now part of the, their guidelines on use of continuous glucose monitoring in pregnancy because of the economic and cost-saving measures that this entailed for the neonates. So could we use continuous glucose monitoring as a screening uh, mechanism for gestational diabetes? Well, there is a very recent pilot study that got published in this area, and they had some fantastic findings. It was a small cohort of 87 women, and what they found was that the CGM was, unsurprisingly, significantly more acceptable to the women than the oral glucose tolerance test, with 81% being in favour for it and that it actually was accurate in um, showing up time out of range, time out of the glucose range. So it represented a more acceptable alternative for gestational diabetes diagnosis compared to the oral glucose tolerance test. And they used um, some in triangulation analyses uh, with looking at uh, risk factor scores and the oral glucose tolerance test and the continuous glucose monitor, which was put put through all of the women. And they did find that there were actually some false positives, meaning that there were women who, and this is actually of great importance to women doing low carb. So basically what this means is the oral glucose toler tolerance test they got a positive on, so it looked like they had gestational diabetes. 
But when you looked at their CGMs, they had a very smooth, flat trace with most of the time, time in range, which basically got them out of that situation of being diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And on the flip side, you will often see women who actually look quite metabolically unwell and they have many, um, many problems with uh, their metabolic health. And they actually pass the oral glucose tolerance test with flying colours. And this is called what is a false negative because those women on these CGMs were then found to have a lot of time out of the range with their blood sugar levels. So, of course, we need more research in this area. It's a very small cohort they looked at. But I think with larger cohorts of patients, uh, I would watch this space because I think continuous glucose monitoring is coming to many more women than just those with diabetes in pregnancy. So my proposed model for gestational diabetes screening looks something like this, and it's what I assist my uh, women in my practice to um, move forward with in a pregnancy if they choose to continue a low-carb pattern of eating. In the first trimester, if they don't have thalassemia or significant iron deficiency, we can do a HbA1c, plus or minus a fasting insulin, plus or minus a C-peptide, which is a marker of pancreatic function. The reason we do it this way is that we can identify if the women were already uh, pre-diabetic at the beginning of their pregnancy and therefore put in place far more proactive measures. Then at the 24 to 28 week mark, which is typically when we would do the oral glucose tolerance test, I often place a continuous glucose monitor onto my patients. Well, in fact, it's not technically a continuous glucose monitor, it's the flash glucose monitors, which are a lot more cheaper, but they can still um, have the same effect. The only difference is you use a scanner with them all the time rather than having a meter that's sort of um, constantly measuring the glucose. And what we do is together with self-monitoring the finger prick glucose, we ensure that the calibration is correct between the two meters and then we can monitor what happens over a two week period. Some of these women still choose to have the oral glucose tolerance test and that is perfectly acceptable. They have some impressive uh, rises on their, um, on their glucose, um, on their continuous glucose monitors when they do take that 75 gram drink. But um, what we actually advise them is to try and do some self-monitoring to meet the targets written down below. And these targets are internationally agreed um, by the, um, in, uh, the International Federation uh, with, regarding gestational diabetes because not all women can actually get, get through that oral glucose tolerance test simply because it can make many of them too sick to complete it. So a well-formulated low-carb diet should be considered as both a prevention and a treatment strategy or option for gestational diabetes. I would love to see this put forth as an option at the beginning of a pregnancy or even in the preconception phase rather than leaving it far too late into the second and third trimester when we have missed the boat with some of those critical things like neural tube defects. And lastly, women are already doing it. And they're doing it, unfortunately, without supervision because there are, very, there are not many supportive health professionals in this space. We can't leave women waiting up to 20 years from now for the dietary guidelines to change. We aren't going to see randomised control trials in pregnancy because in many ways it's quite unethical to do it like this. So it is lost time for those who are planning a pregnancy or in a pregnancy right now. I think our responsibility as health professionals is to give patients the best available evidence that we have um, at the time and help and support them to make appropriate decisions for them. So thank you very much for your time and you can find out more about my clinic um, at our website and on our social media channels. Thank you. Thank you.